Evangelicals and Slavery Challenges and Lessons for Today. Okay, so you and I. We certainly shouldn't, we certainly should reflect, not think that what we've been talking about so far is something for other people. Uh, Forrest Strickland uh, observed this about Spurgeon's library. From just a cursory glance at his library, it seems clear that Spurgeon read books of national and political interest. He had a real interest in the lands Britain was engaged in at the time. There are many books um, on their colonies, but why these books on nations who were under British rule? Spurgeon considered it his pastoral calling to understand the cultural conversations of the day. Then, uh, of course, it raises a question, if Whitfield and others sinned in aspects of their position, how will the future judge us? What sins are we involved in that we have no awareness awareness of? Are sins committed in ignorance still sins? How should we work out the relevance for today of the principles behind the connection that that many made regarding how we treat slavery and the consequences for the spread of the gospel? Do those principles apply in other fields? Are we involved in anything that may unwittingly hinder the gospel? Do we agree with the distinction Spurgeon, Robinson, Daw, and Beetson made between individual and national sins and Wilberforce? If so, what do we think about national judgments, national days of prayer? Does this require national repentance? How should we respond to arguments today that are very close to the gradualist positions that we saw earlier? I didn't use that word earlier, but there's a distinction between those who went for immediate emancipation, (coughs) William Nib I'll come back to, and those who were gradualists. Wilberforce was a gradualist, um, and uh, or to the position that Thomas Chalmers took with with regard to fellowship with Christians who are slave owners, perhaps not far from aspects of the Southern theologian's position. Uh, One example today is an American, Douglas Wilson. This is what Douglas Wilson says. Slavery itself was not an inherent evil. Godly Christians could be members in good standing in Christian churches while owning slaves. The Bible permits Christians in slave-owning cultures to own slaves provided they are treated well. Nothing could be plainer than the fact that a Christian could simultaneously be a slave owner and a member in good standing in a Christian church. Okay, I'm going to work through these questions and challenges. First, the involvement of Christians and churches as Christians and churches in political level interventions. As the slavery issue bears on it, I'm not going to talk about the whole of that issue. Um, I want to talk about this question about Christians keeping close to God while being publicly involved. So I think we can learn something from this. And then the whole question of reparations, Christians and what I'd prefer to call restorative justice rather than reparations. How and what should we remember as Christians? What are the lessons we should learn when Christians disagree? And how should we approach the Bible's teaching? (coughs) Christians and the political. I have a reasonable amount to say on this. Uh, John Newton, I suppose there's hardly an objection can be made to the wish of thousands, perhaps of millions, for the suppression of this trade, but on the ground of political expedience. So that's the only grounds people can think you could possibly defend slavery. It's politically expedient to do so. And we've seen that Christians spoke of loving their country. John Beetson insisted, I love my country in many respects. I think honorably of it and deem myself under peculiar obligations to express my gratitude to him who's fixed the bounds of my habitation that I was born in the 18th century under the present mild and equitable government. Andrew Fuller Uh, expressed a typical position in a sermon on Christian patriotism. O my country, I will lament thy faults, yet with all thy faults I'll seek thy good, not only as a Briton but as a Christian. Wilberforce (coughs) has an undated entry in his spiritual journal in 1817. He was just writing notes to himself, so this is how it reads. 
Gratitudes, motives too. Born in the 18th century and in England, when the increased wealth and civilization have enabled me to enjoy so many accommodations necessary to my usefulness, much more to my comfort. NB, meditate of its opposites, as first not in Africa or Hindustan or China. Um, sorry, Maria, my wife is glad he was not born in China. Uh, um, or even Italy or France. Um, born an Englishman, that I was born of parents religious according to the old school. Andrew Fuller. Uh, I'll draw heavily on the particular Baptists, uh, they're very helpful. His position was that it becomes Christians to bear positive goodwill to their country and to its government, considered as government, irrespective of the political party which may have the ascendancy. To prevent mistakes, however, it's proper to observe that the patriotism required of us is not that love of our country which seeks its prosperity at the expense of the general happiness of mankind, such is that of all others where Christian principle is not allowed to direct it. Such, I'm ashamed to say, is that with which some have advocated the cause of Negro slavery. It is, it is necessary, forsooth, to the wealth of this country? No, if my country cannot prosper but at the expense of justice, humanity and the happiness of mankind, let it be unprosperous. Fuller had more to say in a, a lovely little book he wrote on about backsliding where he gives us one form of backsliding, taking an eager and deep interest in political disputes, which he suggests many in the present age have fallen prey to, and speaks of his own period as one where this had employed the conversation of all cases of people. And he warns how seductive such ideas prove. The flattering objects held by, out by revolutionists, um, I haven't got time to deal with this, but the significance of the influence of the French Revolution is profoundly important in this period on how Christians thought. The flattering objects held by revolutionists were so congenial with the wishes of humanity and their pretenses to disinterested philanthropy so fair that many religious people for a time forgot their own principles. When a man's thoughts and affections are filled with such things as these, the scriptures become a kind of dead letter, while the speeches and writings of politicians are the lively oracles. The position politically of some Baptists and independents Congregationalists at that time was an occasional cause for tension. A man called William Button served as the secretary for the Baptist ministers who met regularly at the Jamaica Coffee House for fellowship and mutual encouragement for the Baptist work. On one occasion in 1798, a man called John Martin spoke on a Lord's Day evening lecture was held at Broad Street Chapel. He suggested that if the French invaded England, many Baptists and other dissenters would join them. There was great fear at that time that, it, uh, that, that France was about to invade England. Great fear. Um, w words of his remarks um, came to Abraham Boo, the senior Baptist minister at the time, who wrote to Martin objecting to the statements, suggesting that they would bring unnecessary acrimony to the Baptist cause. Martin wouldn't stand down. Um, I believe he was stood down in some sense. Uh, William Nibb, um, I've glanced at, more important for us, sent to Jamaica as a teacher after his brother died there. There was a, a rebellion of the slaves in December 1830 in Jamaica, sometimes called the Baptist War. And there was a misleading view that the Baptist missionaries had supported, even encouraged it. Uh, Nib was arrested on suspicion of complicity in this, later arrested without charge. In fact, a large-scale slave-owning landowner, one of the plantations, wrote to him, uh, 1832, I deeply regret that the feelings of the country should so strongly mark out yourself and the other Baptist missionaries as objects of persecution. Religion had nothing to do with the late disturbances, but on the contrary, its absence was a chief cause of them. But this man was exception, exceptional. The plantation owners, and I should say the, the Anglican church, were totally opposite to the view of the Baptist missionaries on, on slavery. <coughs> Nib wrote home, value your privileges, Britons, and feel and pray for those poor Christian slaves who are entirely under the control of such beings. No fault had I committed, but I was a missionary and that was enough. 
I, am, I was thankful that I felt a disposition to pray for my enemies. He was often downcast. <coughs> But speaking to, um, back in England, he was constantly back and forth, died very young. In 1833, feeling as I did the rights of the Negro, his capacity for improvement, his steady attachment to the truths of the gospel under heavy persecution, I felt bound to assert his claim to immediate emancipation. Um, he was given a letter of instruction by a man called John Dyer, who was the first secretary of the Baptist Missionary Society. The letter says this. Probably it was a standard letter given to all missionaries, I suspect. You must ever bear in mind that as a resident in Jamaica, you have nothing to do with its civil or political affairs, and with these you must never interfere. You cannot justly incur the displeasure of those among whom you may be placed. The gospel of Christ you well know, so far from producing or countenancing a spirit of rebellion or insubordination, has a directly opposite tendency. Most of the servants addressed by the Apostle Paul in his epistles were slaves, and he exhorts them to be obedient to their own masters in singleness of heart, fearing God. Well, without disagreeing with the scriptures that Di was quoting, he, he was not happy with how this was drawn out. And speaking at the annual meeting of the BMS at that time, which got huge crowds, enormous crowds, numbers turned up. He, he links speaking out on slavery with preaching the gospel. If it be said, as it may be, that this is a subject at variance with the objects of the society, I say we should still have maintained the silence that had been imposed upon us as to civil and political affairs, however enormous and cruel and revolting the evils we were compelled to witness. We, we would have maintained it had they not at last deprived us of the privilege of telling the poor, ill-used and oppressed slave that he would, if a believer in the gospel, spend an eternity of happiness in heaven. But this they have done, and therefore we can be silent no longer. He went on, uh, he was speaking at the front, and John Dyer was a platform, so he, he was there, and, and the, the um, BMS officers were behind him. John Dyer um, didn't, uh, um, Nib didn't have a jacket like this, he had a coat with tails. So John Dyer pulled his coat tails. In other words, be careful, be careful. You're going too far. Um, and this is what um, <laughs> Nib immediately said. Whatever may be the consequence, I will speak at the risk of my connection with the society and all I hold dear, I will avow this. If I fail of arousing your sympathies, I'll retire from this meeting and call upon him who is made of one blood or nations that dwell upon the face of the earth. And if I die without beholding the emancipation of my brethren and sisters in Christ, then if prayer is permitted in heaven, I will fall at the feet of the eternal crying, Lord, open the eyes of Christians in England to see the evil of slavery and to banish it from the earth. In a speech uh, in Norwich, he made remarks on his later views on politics and Christianity. In the discussion of this subject, some may be apt to suppose that we're entering into politics. If so, I for one say, I cannot help it. He was ready to denounce, the unright denounce unrighteousness as unrighteousness, whether it be clothed in lawn and covered with a mitre, bishops, or whether it be found in the law books of our country, the politicians. So, generally the particular Baptist did discourage politics in the pulpit other than on occasions of national fast days. But despite the shared concern about bringing politics into the pulpit, these preachers were convinced that they had to speak to this issue because for them it was a moral issue, not a political or economic one per se. Um, Booth, William Booth, um, so Andrew Booth, uh, makes this very clear. That slavery against which I'm going to pl plead is not a civil or political kind, but entirely of a personal nature. I never thought subjects of that nature proper to be discussed in the pulpit and especially on the Lord's Day. But the exercise of moral justice, of benevolence and of, and of humanity being enforced by every principle of evangelical truth and endeavour to promote those virtuous affections towards our extremely degraded and oppressed fellow creatures, the Negroes, must be completely consistent with the commands of divine law, the grace of the glorious gospel, and the solemnities of public worship. And uh, secondly, um, 
Keeping close to God while being publicly involved. I'll take Wilberforce, I'll take two examples, Wilberforce and Nib. Wilberforce was acutely sensitive to this question throughout his life and was ever his own harshest critic. I, I do recommend his spiritual journals to read. Uh, not easy to read because they're all in uh, kind of um, 18th century um, shorthand note form. He wrote in 1788 to say, my walk I'm sensible is a public one, my business is in the world, and I must mix in assemblies with men or quit the post which providence has seems to have assigned to me. Yet he found the necessary company of non-Christians often difficult. I've been dining, dining out and afterwards and assembling at the chief barons. Alas, how little like a company of Christians. Surely I have no business at such places. What dost thou hear, Elijah? Vanity is excited or one's pride is mortified, a sort of hollow cheerfulness in every countenance. And he continued ever burdened for the Prime Minister, his close friend, William Pitt, for his salvation. Poor Pitt, alas, alas, oh, if he knew the way of life. And in 1796, he listed in January, he was he set it aside for himself a day of secret prayer and exercises. I mean, he was so busy, this man, but he still made sure he was able to do that. <coughs> he and he, he listed what the reasons why he should do that. I've just given you three of them. Five. The state of public affairs is highly critical and calls for earnest deprecation of the divine displeasure. I have been graciously supported in difficult situations of a public nature. My station is in life is a very difficult one wherein I am at a loss to know how to go on. He, he, in that year he'd had one of numerous major setbacks in trying to get legislation um, through the house. In, in April 1796 he wrote, to, uh, he, he made a note that um, Hannah Moore um, uh, asked me how I did to preserve a heavenly spiritual frame. Alas, I don't preserve it, yet I would humbly aspire after at all, um, all else is folly and vanity and vexation of spirit. He followed with a list of my chief sins, including not enough careful for souls of others, not one thousandth part desirous enough of growth in grace, prayers often cold and formal, a sort of contempt for persons inferior in knowledge of Christianity, how inconsistent with true Christian humility. Five, four years later, I hope humbly that I am resolved, resolvedly determined for Christ and not solicitous about worldly greatness, wealth, reputation. But alas, I'm sadly unspiritual in my common feelings. I fear more solicitous about my credit than about truth. He laments his lively sensibility about earthly things, especially worldly estimation. In April he says, God has not blessed me in my work because I have not laboured in his faith and fear, but vaingloriously. August uh, 1806, I walked out, I went for a walk with Owen on spiritual mindedness, I think that's volume two in Owen's works. He went out with Owen on spiritual mindedness and John Newton's book on communion with God. He went out reading them. See? If he stays in his house, he'd be constant people on the door needing to see him. Later in life, he records, when I look back on my parliamentary life and see how little all taken together, I've duly adorned the doctrine of God my Saviour. I am ashamed and humbled in the dust. May any time which remains, Lord, be better employed. I've made that my prayer sometimes. May any time that may remain, Lord, be better employed. William Nibb. Someone overheard him one morning in 1840. He di died in his early 40s, I think, and this was towards the end of his life. I heard him speaking in a suppressed voice. And William Nibb was the most radical of, of uh, critics, as you perhaps picked up from the quotations I've given. O oh, my father, suffer none of these things to draw me away from thee. Let not pride prevail. Keep, O oh, keep me humble. Rather take me from my work which is so dear to me than suffer me by vanity to disgrace thy cause. Let me never withdraw my heart from thee to place it on the best of thy servants. 
the, the, the recorder of this says, after a moment's pause, I entered. I seem to see him now, his hands covered his eyes and tears were chasing each other down his cheeks. As soon as he heard me, he hastily wiped them away and looked up with a sweet smile. He said, ah, oh, my child, he was a young man. These things are hard to bear. It is more than I expected and I tremble lest they should draw my soul from God. And then in a letter to his wife uh, written at sea, uh, my ardent prayer is that God would more deeply impress upon my heart the necessity of living entirely to his glory. Oh, what mercies we have to be thankful for, what sins to deplore. Third question, reparations and remembering um, Christians and restorative justice. Um, the Caribbean community, CARICOM, set up a reparations commission uh, 10 years ago. Uh, Jamaica <coughs> has been arguing for reparation from a conservative MP whose ancestors were pioneers in the sugar and slave trade. Uh, William and Kate were, in March last year, were in Jamaica and they were met with calls for Jamaica's reparations from Jamaica's Prime Minister. This photo did not help as a fence keeping all the people back, all the black people back, while Kate and Prince walk, shaking fingers through holes in the fence. That was a, not a good move. Laura Trevelyan, who some of you may have heard of, uh, then a BBC reporter, not now, uh, visited Granada. I felt ashamed and also felt it was my duty. You can't repair the past, but you can acknowledge the pain. The aristocratic Trevelyan family, who owned six sugar plantations in uh, Grenada, uh, are going to pay reparations. In March, uh, Trinity College Cambridge announced it's to appoint an academic to a four-year post to examine its legacies of slavery. Uh, Trinity College has pledged to donate a million pound over five years to Cambridge Caribbean scholarships. We can add the Royal Household, the Bank of England, the University of Glasgow, National Trust, Kew Gardens, Roundtree Society, Lloyds of London and others who've done much the same. Uh, a man called David Olasoga, writing uh, this year for the Guardian newspaper, asks, um, if we can inherit wealth and benefit over centuries from compound interest, do we not equally inherit responsibility? After all, the tentacles of this history do not stay neatly in the past. And no one alive today is responsible for the views or actions of Britons who lived and died over 150 years ago, yet they're responsible for us and the world we inhabit. Studying British history is not just about understanding what happened, but also where we came from, how we did so, and why. He suggests that slavery is an unpayable debt by the very nature and scale of the horror of the crime, any response will never be enough. And he speaks of friends living in renovated warehouses that once stored produce made by enslaved people. This does not mean that I hate these buildings or that they are not beautiful, but it matters because it explains why they are there. Uh, should reparations be made? Uh, once again, when we think historically about this, we're not the first people to say this. Let's go back to these good guys. John Beetson urged his heroes, inform the inhabitants of Africa that you have done them an injury, that you have violated the law of nations. Inform the unhappy slaves in the various islands that the injury you have done them is, is irreparable, but that you are willing to make every compensation in your power. James Dorr, speaking in his sermon, a sermon on the African slave trade from Isaiah, in which he set out um, how the slave trade works against the fulfillment of gospel promises. And he concluded that if instead of making any reparation, the nation that was guilty reduced the whole, the whole to system and regulated it by law, then they should have re every reason to expect God's punishment. Robert Hawker, a high Calvinist Anglican, in an 1823 letter to Wilberforce, detected a general national accountability in relation to slavery. He said, in the contemplation of such misery, so highly reproachful as it is to the whole community, and in which, let it not be overlooked, every individual of the nation, however incompetent to redress, must justly bear his part, can it indeed be deemed presumptuous in the humblest 
to propose means, if any can be devised, upon constitutional principles for relief. This was ten, writing ten years before the abolition of slavery. Remember, that was 1833. Because in that year, slave owners were paid approximately 20 million pounds. 20 million, 1833 pounds. In compensation in over 40,000 distinct awards for enslaved people because they'd had to free them. This rep rep represented about 40% of the British Treasury's annual spending budget has been calculated as equivalent to around 16.5 billion in today's terms. Okay. I want to refer to a very helpful blog posting by Tabiti Anyabwile on reparations are biblical. He's the author of the book Reviving the Black Church, which I, without commenting, showed the cover of in the previous presentations. He's a council member of the Gospel Coalition. I would define reparations as material and social repayment made as acknowledgement and restitution by an offending party to an aggrieved party for wrongs done in order to repair the injuries, losses and or disadvantages caused by the wrong. He suggests that reparations should have three aims. A. Acknowledgement of the wrongs done. B. Payment for the wrongs done. C. Closure for both parties. Um, because I'm talking about restorative justice, I, I, I've done that partly to say that I don't think just simply talking in terms of financial repayment is, is always helpful. Now most people agree on this. First, that restitution is biblical. There's disagreement about whether to emphasize the individual or groups and whether it's feasible. Um, but I know, uh, 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 he says, uh, but no one I know rejects restitution in principle. The passage is there. Um, second, that a grievous wrong was done in the practice of slavery. Thirdly, that reparation was owed at some point. Even many of the opponents of reparations in today's context would allow that reparations should have been paid at some point. For instance, to the generation of persons freed following 1833 and in the USA following the Civil War in the 1860s. Opponents of reparations argue like this. It would be an injustice today. First, make one person or group who committed no crime pay for the crimes of others. What we can call the innocence objection. Second, to pay to one person or group who were not directly injured by the crime restitution which is owed to those who were originally actually suffered, what he calls the unharmed objection. Thirdly, that taxing today's, it, it, it's injustice to tax today's citizens in order to pay for atrocities paid by, uh, committed by earlier generations, what he calls the generational tax objection. He reasons in the following way. I might put my briefcase in one sentence. If the Lord God himself caused a, head, a state head through taxation to require later generations of people who committed no crime to pay monies to their contemporaries who did not suffer the original crime, then it cannot be unjust, quite the opposite, for state actors to do the same. That sentence encapsulates all three of the objections in the previous slide, okay? He takes the book of Ezra for his case. Um, Ezra chapter one, verses seven to 11. Uh, two generations after the Babylonian defeat by Nebuchadnezzar, an entirely new empire has emerged and a pagan king uninvolved in the sacking of Israel initiates the reparation, the repatriation and reparation of Israel. That reparation began with returning the items taken from the house of the Lord when Nebuchadnezzar defeated them. This was the first act of reparation. It was all by God's hand. Okay, keep a note of those passages. And then uh, Ezra 6, uh, verses 6 to... 12, I'll, I'll uh, read this. 
now therefore, Tatanai, governor of the province beyond the river, um, Shethva, Bozanai, and your associates, the governors who are in the province beyond the river, keep away. Um, let the work on this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I make a decree regarding what you should do for these elders of the Jews for the rebuilding of this house of God. The cost is to be paid to these men in full and without delay from the royal revenue, the tribute of the province from beyond the river. And whatever is needed, bulls, rams or sheep for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine or oil, as the priests at Jerusalem require, let that be given to them day by day without fail that they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons also I make a decree that if anyone alters this edict a beam shall be pulled out of his house um, um, and uh, and so on um, so he, he, there's an example here Darius um, a king who wasn't even born when Israel was conquered, ruling over an empire that wasn't even in existence when the exile began, passed a law decreeing that taxes be paid by people who did not conquer or abuse Israel in order to restore Israelites who themselves were not alive during the Babylonian conquest of Israel. So, Darius' as head of state compels his citizens through taxes to pay a reparation to Israel even though those citizens didn't commit the offense and those Israelites did not directly suffer the abuse. Uh, he, he clarifies what he draws from this. I do not think this historical example necessarily requires reparations. I'm not here drawing a dark line between the book of Ezra and current debates about reparations. I'm simply contending for the principle of reparations as just. I simply think that the historical case of Israel during the days of Ezra proves that reparations in the case of African American descendants of slaves in the United States, he's American, is no injustice at all and therefore is quite Biblical. I just want to make a note on the idea of national repentance. It's quite closely linked, which C.S. Lewis is most helpful. He, he feared that, quote, the fatal charm of national repentance is the encouragement it gives us to turn from the bitter task of repenting of our own sins to the congenial one of bewailing but first of all denouncing the conduct of others. But he asks, is it the duty of Christians to call for national repentance? He says, I think it is. But the office, like many others, can be profitably discharged only by those who discharge it with reluctance. The hard sayings of our Lord are wholesome to those only who find them hard. And briefly, when Christians disagree. We've seen in the life of uh, William Nibb, that's an image of Abraham Booth. The images of the day don't flatter people, do they? Um, but there we are, that's an image of Andrew Booth. Uh, we've seen the tensions uh, in the life of Andrew Booth and in 1795, Andrew Booth saw, uh, received a letter from a Baptist minister in Philadelphia, a Dr. William Rogers. <coughs> Booth had heard that Kentucky, in its recent constitution, quote, provided for the accursed traffic in men and for the enslaving of millions. And he wrote to uh, William Rogers, because um, he wasn't quite sure um, where Rogers stood on this. His response is, either the blacks are not men or such legislators are not Christians. He quotes and challenges phrases from, the, from uh, Rogers' letter to him. Um, phrases such as the United States knows no subjects and we are all citizens and inhabit the freest country on earth. This really got under Abraham Booth's Christian skin, this remark. Um, his irony is scathing. He says, um, we are all citizens, that is, we who have the happiness and honor of wearing not black or mulatto but white skins 
possessed liberty, personal, civil and political, are capable of acquiring large property, are eligible to the first honours in the federal government. It's indeed inserted in an old book, book now but little regarded that God made of one blood all the nations of the men. But we, the genu genuine sons of liberty, will never be persuaded that our blood is specifically the same with that which flows in the veins of a black or mulatto. On the phrase, we inhabit the freest country in the earth, he replies, then every country on the globe must be in a wretched state indeed. But who are these we? Certainly not the blacks nor the mulattoes, but the whites, the lords of the land, those who arrogate the dreadful authority of legalizing the buying and selling and oppressing of their fellow creatures, those who fatten on the tears and sighs and sweat and misery of others that are by nature equal and by demerit not worse than themselves. And on the same claim he later writes, were I in your land of superlative liberty, um, um, the despotism and tyranny, the injustice and cruelty which are legalized and practiced in it would probably make my eyes weep and my heart bleed, melt my soul into compassion for the oppressed myriads and excite the most ardent prayer that God would arise to plead their cause and raise them to the rank of men. Uh, just a note there about uh, that term mulatto today but n not then, a, a very offensive term, uh, used, much used in the southern states to describe persons of mixed white and black ancestry. Um, analogous to how the word Eurasian is used today in parts of Asia. And then when Christians disagree, what should we do? We should understand as fully as you can the position taken by those with whom you disagree. Never jump and fire off two barrels, however profoundly you disagree. Secondly, always represent the position of those with whom you disagree fairly and adequately. Never caricature the position you don't like. Thirdly, be willing to accept you may be mistaken. Justin Welby, another quote. Uh, uh, this is a really helpful quote. Let's be suspicious, let's ask the hard questions, but let's do it in a way in which we learn to disagree well and let's, and let's avoid saying that someone who disagrees with me is unfit to be called a human being and heard or published or whatever it happens to be. And then when Christians fall short, just one quotation of a recent uh, book this year by Marsden on Jonathan Edwards. Um, because there is, you go searching on the internet and you will very quickly find some deeply dismissive writing about people like Edwards, Whitfield, the Puritans and others. Marsden said this. <coughs> While we acknowledge that Edwards was wrong regarding slaveholding, that fault surely does not nullify the value of his insight on many other matters. And such attitudes of generosity should be especially evident regarding the blind spots of people in other eras who lived in circumstances we only dimly understand. If we did not accept the principle that we can learn profound things from people who have serious flaws and inconsistencies, typo, uh, then we could not learn from anyone excepting Jesus and no one could learn from us. Uh, I've given on this slide the passages and verses that which those Christians opposed to slavery appealed. I wonder, as these verses cropped up, if any of you were struck by how, many, how the scriptures from which many of those who opposed the slave trade and slavery appealed were not simply passages that talk about slavery. They didn't focus especially much, for instance, on Philemon and Onesimus. The point I want to make is that we should have the same Bible-wide way of thinking about this issue. You shouldn't just look up a concordance for the word slavery and then limit it to that. For instance, it would help us to understand more carefully what we learn about such remembering in Scripture. I think it would be very interesting to do a, Bible, a, a, a study of what the Bible says about ideas about restoring and remembering and on being a citizen. It would be a very helpful Bible study. Postscript. <clears throat> 
last slide. We should agree regarding Wilberforce, uh, to quote Haig again. It, Haig, I, I don't know William Haig's religious faith position, but he is most understanding and sympathetic to Wilberforce's evangelical faith. It was his evangelical convictions that gave unity and coherence to his work. In a long and arduous public life, he showed unyielding reverence for the truth, loyalty, integrity, and principle as he understood it, setting an example that has stirred the hearts and elevated the minds of generations on generations who followed. It may also be said uh, that the movement against the slave trade produced in the words of W.E. Lecchio, a very important historian of a previous generation, it produced, quote, men, men and women, uh, men careless indeed for glory, but very careful of honor, who were refusing to devi deviate one hair's breadth from the course they believed to be their duty. John Coffey says, it stands to this day as perhaps the finest political achievement of what would now be called faith-based activism, and we should be thankful for that. Are we challenged by Wilberforce? As a Christian, I am sharply, sharply. And Coffey reminds us how the success of Wilberforce and his allies was a powerful testimony to the transformative power of the gospel and heralded the emergence of evangelicalism as a major cultural force. And to end where we began, it is a story that should disturb and challenge, chasten and inspire. Thank you.